At this first lecture, we will have the privilege of listening to Brother Norman Gibson from Denver, Colorado. Norman is no stranger to these parts, having lived for a number of years in the Metroplex area, serving the Lord's Church, and more particularly in Grand Prairie, but now for a number of years has been with the Bear Valley Church in Denver. Norman in days past has spent again considerable time up in the northeastern section of the United States in the mission fields and has served as one of the instructors of the Bear Valley School of Preaching and also as the director of that school. But as of now is dedicating his full energies to the pulpit of that good congregation. We're delighted to have the Gibsons in our area and to have them here with us at Brown Trail and here in the Fort Worth Lectures. And Brother Gibson will be speaking at this hour on a glossary of some difficult Old Testament words, words we commonly just read and go on over and never really dig beneath the surface and study. Norm, it's mighty good to have you. Brother Norman Gibson. Thank you, Brother Winkler. It's a joy to be here. I'm very happy to be back in the area. I was thinking to myself about a day when Brother Lonzel Ross and I left Grand Prairie, came over to Highway 183, drove all the way into Fort Worth looking for somebody, thinking we might be able to start a congregation somewhere between Grand Prairie and Fort Worth on 183. We finally found about two miles south of that highway one brother who was going in to worship in Haltom City at the time. Times have changed. I'm grateful for that. It's good to have a number of old friends, some family here. My dear sister, Lorraine Parker from Abilene, Texas, and her daughter and son-in-law and a number of people from Grand Prairie, some whom I knew in other years. I just spoke to one of the elders of the Sunset Church at Lubbock, but he left. Now, the reason he left, he said, <laughs> the reason he left was that he had a little grandson with him, and that boy was planning to go to class, and when he found out they'd all be in here, it just nearly overwhelmed the little lad. So at least, at least that was the excuse he gave. We'll later on find out if there was a deeper reason. Word studies are fascinating and a little bit difficult and can be very dry and boring. And yet every one of you is aware that each word has its own meaning or set of meanings. Let me ask you for a moment just what comes to your mind when I speak the word fast. Now let me give you some help. Did anybody think of this meaning? The boat was tied fast to the dock. How many thought of that meaning of the word fast? He went on a three-day fast. How many of you thought of that? <laughs> All right, that means doing without food, which a number of us could do on occasions with some profit. And then the boy ran fast. How many of you thought of that? Well, I will not belabor you with that. I'm indebted to my brother-in-law, Earl Parker, of precious memory to me for an early illustration of this. He told about a stranger who came to this country, and he was having so much difficulty with our language. When he was introduced to his host, and he shook hands with him, he said, you have a very firm grip. And then when they got ready to leave the train station, he said, let me carry your grip. And he picked up his suitcase. And in his halting English, he asked, how is your wife? And he said, she's sick. She has the grip. <laughs> now, that happens in Hebrew as well. There are deliberate puns. In fact, uh, Micah is the punster of the Old Testament, but they didn't give me that assignment. We're not generally known, really, as a people who love the Old Testament, and that's unfortunate. In fact, in a meeting in New Mexico not many years ago, the elders were nonplussed because there was a brother then in his 90s who was so rabid about this point that any time anybody quoted a passage from the Old Testament or they studied a lesson in the adult class from the Old Testament, I'll call him Brother Jones because I can't remember his name. 
You, you Jones boys will pardon me. But Brother Jones would say, all oh, what you want to do that for? That's in the Old Testament. We're New Testament Christians. What you want to do that for? And he wouldn't let the elders, and I'm saying that in what sense you know, conduct the class. So one of them appealed to me for help, and I said, well, let's go and see what we can do for the brother. And so when he said we weren't supposed to study the Old Testament, I said, well, i tell you what let's do. Let's read the New Testament. Would you turn with me over here to the language of the Apostle Peter? And here's what he said. He said, I want you to be mindful of the words spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I said, Brother Jones, what were those words spoken by the holy prophets? Well, a little daylight began to dawn, but he didn't quite want to admit it. And after he finally saw that this is a commandment in the New Testament, that we should remember the Old Testament materials, have a mind full of them, he started to sputter a little, and I said as quietly as I could, Now, Brother Jones, you're not going to argue with the Apostle Peter, are you? He said, Well, no, he knows more about it than I'll ever know. And so... As far as I have heard, once the old brother saw that the New Testament said we should be aware of what the Old Testament teaches, then he was all right. But I'd better get into specific things. That was 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. And New Testament believers, therefore, must remember the words of the prophets in the old times, and you are all aware of Romans 15, verse 4, wherein Paul stated that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It's a special pleasure to me to have a part in this lectureship that's dedicated to some of these difficult texts, and of course my assignment is to study a few words. The first word I was assigned is the word Ariel. I'd like to mention the suffix El is one of the Hebrew names for God. When you're reading your Old Testament, just look for words that end in El, and you'll find some very instructive things. For instance, when Jacob saw that vision, he named the place Bethel, and he said, Surely this is none other than the house of God, Bethel. Emmanuel, from the prophecy of Isaiah, is interpreted God with us. And that's what Jesus is. He came to be with us. Now, Ariel is used in different senses in the Old Testament, like our words fast and grip. A man named Ariel is mentioned in Ezra 8, verse 16, in the listings that Ezra gives concerning the return. And in 2 Samuel 23, verse 20, we read about a man who killed two sons of Ariel of Moab. He went down and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. Ariel seems to mean a lion of God, but it also is the name of the city where David encamped. God mentions he will distress Ariel, she will be unto me as Ariel, from Isaiah 29, 1 and 2. But in verses 3 and 4 we read, And I will encamp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with posted troops, and I will raise siege works against thee, all this against Ariel, and thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. If you have lived any time in Mormon country, and I say this respectfully, but it's a fact, they have perverted this text of Scripture to claim this is the origin of the Book of Mormon. What a strange and terrible thing to do for their cause. 
Now they have applied this to the hill of Cumorah and the discovery of the Mormon sacred records, but the fatal nature of the text is seen in that it sounds like one who has a familiar spirit. Well, this is the language describing witchcraft in the Old Testament. I think I would never have chosen that verse to use for a proof text for a religious doctrine. The Mormons have not done themselves any service by misapplying these quotations concerning Ariel to themselves. But there's one other meaning. Brown, Driver, and Briggs in their lexicon page 72 of the edition that I had available, lists this as meaning the hearth of God, H-E-A-R-T-H. Discussing this with one brother, he suggested, now that's the center of a man's home where he can prop up his feet and be warm. That's true, but that's also the place where you can build enough fire to burn down the house. And in the context, that's exactly what it's talking about. God was going to build a fire that would punish that wicked city that fits all that's discussed there. So of all of these meanings, you can see why we would need to study such a word as Ariel. Take the word cherubim next. May I mention here in passing that I am is one of the plural forms in Hebrew. Usually, if you have a word with that ending, it means more than one of anything. Cherub would be the singular form, and that does occur. But the cherubim, more than one, appear early in the biblical text. For instance, you can see this in our sacred song, the writer of the old hymn, Cherubim and seraphim bowing down before thee who wast and art and evermore shall be. That's one kind of angels and another kind of angels all bowing down in worship to God. But in Genesis, you can read chapter 3, verse 24, God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flame of a sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, or to guard the way of the tree of life. I could not think of anything worse than sin unless it would be living forever in sin. And so when sin came into the world, it was necessary that God remove mankind from this earth through death. God's justice required it. He could not have been the God of righteousness and have allowed man to live forever in a sinful condition. So the way to the tree of life was barred to the sinful Adam and Eve before they were in its presence. As long as they were there, life was available for them. And it's only when we reach the last book of the New Testament that we find the tree of life restored in the paradise of God. Later in history than the incident in uh, the garden, when God gave instructions for the tabernacle, he had Moses to make two cherubim of gold. And these stood on top of the mercy seat. If you can imagine that this would be the chest that was called the mercy seat, there would be a cherub here and a cherub over here, the two of them called cherubim, and their wings outstretched and touching or nearly so, in the center, the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. As you read in Hebrews chapter 9, the one instance, I believe, in which that verse occurs. So there they are pictured as the guardians of the law and as the keepers of the place where God meets with his people. It's very similar to the idea that you have in the book of Genesis. But there it is kept so that we may all have access to it. In the story in Eden, mankind was barred from it. But do we not rejoice that we can all come unto God by him because he ever lives to make intercession for us? And Helasterion, the mercy seat, is actually the very place where God meets with his people. It's the word translated, I believe, propitiation. It suggests that Jesus takes care of our sins. 
In number seven, verse 89, when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, meaning with God, then he heard the voice speaking unto him from above the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and he spake unto him. Now, that ought to give us a sense of awe, as it certainly did God's man of long ago. Can you imagine going by yourself into a little curtained room, a cube, actually? The curtains close behind you, and then there in the presence of these images, there is a divine light shining. The Jews call that the Shekinah, the light of the glory of God. And then a voice out of that that would say, Moses, don't you know God had Moses' full attention? And so this reverence that was induced on the part of God's prophet certainly ought to be in ours, in our hearts when we read the word. Now the psalmist must have felt likewise when he prayed, O thou shepherd of Israel, give ear, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that sittest above the cherubim, shine forth. May the glory of God burst out, the psalmist was saying. Psalm 80 and verse 1. Now in Ezekiel chapter 10, the cherubim are associated with the coming destruction of Jerusalem. In my boyhood, we had a quartet, and we used to sing, Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw a wheel way in the middle of the air. And I don't know where the writer got the idea, but he said, the big, field, big wheel run by faith and the little wheel run by the grace of God. He was looking for some application. Had fine ideas, except the only explanation that you'll find in chapters 1 through 10 in Ezekiel are that this was a likeness of the glory of God. And again, that ought to implant some reverence in our hearts. Now, as you read that story, there's a man in a linen coat and he has a writer's ink horn, and he's going around marking people. And these cherubim are going to destroy everybody that he hasn't marked. In the story, as Ezekiel saw the vision, these are the destroying messengers of the Lord for a very wicked city. And when you read Ezekiel 1 through 10, I hope that this will come through more clearly to you. So when the man in the linen coat reached in and took some coals from between the cherubim and scattered them over the city of Jerusalem, then says Ezekiel 10, 15, the cherubim were lifted up. And the picture is that after God had taken vengeance, the hearth of God, you see, is real now that the coals are scattered over Jerusalem. Then he was leaving that wicked city. After Solomon built the temple, Cherubim were placed in it also. Now these were wooden figures, and they were placed along the wall guarding the uh, other furniture of the holy place, but their wing tips stretched out. There they were placed from side to side and touched each other in the center. This we have a permanent place where there would be no necessity of moving it as they had to carry the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim on the top originally. So the one New Testament reference speaks, Hebrews 9, 5, I've already mentioned, of the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. And then the writer says, of which we cannot now speak particularly. I don't know about you, about you, but when I read that, I want to say, go ahead, go right on. I got plenty of time. <laughs> but one of these days, by the grace of God, when there isn't any more time, but all eternity is with us, then we can explore more fully in the presence of the cherubim of glory and of all the angels of God those wonderful things and the foreshadowing of that covenant through which Jesus saved us by his precious blood. Now again, in God's dealing with the proud prince of Tyre, he has Ezekiel to say, chapter 28, verse 2, Yet thou art man, and not God, 
And this despite the claims of the prince of Tyre to greatness. Verse 13 says, Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Verse 14 reads, Thou wast the anointed cherub that covereth, and I set thee so that thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. If you've done much reading of Jehovah's Witnesses books or anything that's allied to them, and there are a lot of such things, you know that these verses are often used as if they were speaking of Satan. And if you pick out a phrase here and there, you can make out a fairly good case. But nothing could be more clear than that this was a lamentation against the Prince of Tyre. That's stated in the text. Kipling's old dictum that has been used in journalism classes ever since is a helpful thing in Bible study. He says, I have six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were what and where and when and why and how and who. That's it. All right, now let's ask some questions. What's under discussion here? Who is speaking? Of whom is he speaking? And when you apply all of that, you will say, well, it's God's prophet, but he's talking about the prince of Tyre, and he is speaking of God's judgment upon him. Just ask what and where and why and how and who. Now notice, there are some clues in here that make it clear this cannot be Satan. In Ezekiel 28, 16, God says in this text, I have cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I have destroyed thee, O covering cherub. Now, cherub is the singular form we've mentioned. Cherubim, plural. I have destroyed thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So the text, has Satan been destroyed? Had he been before Jesus ever came? Verse 18 reads, and this one is the clincher, I have turned thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And then verse 19 says, Thou shalt never more have any being. Wouldn't that have been neat? If centuries before the Lord came into the world, Satan would have been burned to ashes and scattered around and not had any being. That would have been very nice, except that isn't any way to deal with the word of God. When Jesus came, Satan was still comparable to a strong man, but the stronger one came and tied him up and took away his goods. You know that story. Well, this this is what comes of mishandling Scripture and that type of misinterpretation. Now, the word zerah in Hebrew means seed, and I found four basic meanings listed. It means a sowing or planting seed. Isaac sowed or literally seeded, using that as a verb, in that land and found in the same year a hundredfold. A good many years ago, after the nation of Israel was founded again in the 1940s, an article came out in Reader's Digest. (coughs) It read, The Bible Builds Israel. And what they discovered was that if they wanted to know something about their country, all they needed to do was go back and read the Old Testament and they would have the information they needed. And so in this area where Isaac lived, they read that and they decided, well, it must be a good country for grain. We'll plant some wheat there and see how it does. It prospered. They said, no, we never did do as well as Isaac. We never did get a hundredfold, but it's good wheat country. And so when they planted the wheat there, it grew. Now, it also may mean, zero may mean, the thing sown. Give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land be not desolate. That's the plea of the people of Egypt to Joseph in Genesis 47, verse 19. This is also used in a moral or spiritual sense. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126, verse 6. Now that text has comforted many a saint when he was discouraged. Some of you brethren have been having it rather rough back where you are, haven't you? If we had time, you could tell me all about it, but you don't get more than half the time. I've got some things to say too. 
Why, certainly we have difficulties. Satan will see to it that we do have problems. But what, will it not be a golden day when the heart that oft has sown in tears shall reap some day in joy? And it will. You keep on sowing. Sow that seed. In the Bible, the seed is used of the human sperm. If the woman be not defiled but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. Numbers 5 verse 28, talking about that curious jealousy trial. Then number four, our principal meaning and then the problem. The offspring are the descendants. God promised Abraham after he had separated from Lot, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, in thy seed also shall be numbered. Genesis 13, 16. And it's on this point that we have a problem. When the RSV was published in 1952, the Old Testament part, there was a great outcry because of Isaiah 7:14, which they translated, a young woman shall conceive and bring forth a son. But there was a problem with the text in Genesis 22, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because I hast obeyed my voice. The preaching on the seed promise had echoed through the preaching of all our pioneer ancestors in the Restoration days. So when the RSV men translated this, by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves, the outcry was even greater because it raised another problem. It caused Moses to contradict Paul and Genesis to contradict Galatians. Paul had not only quoted the text, but he had made an argument on it. He didn't say seeds as of many. He said seed as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So they translated it descendants. That, in the vernacular, blows <laughs> Paul's argument, does it not? Well, when these men came to the New Testament, though, they did pretty well. They had to translate what Paul said and listen to the way they did it. They said the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, which is Christ. Now, if they had put offspring in the Old Testament word instead of descendants, then they wouldn't have fouled up Paul and Moses alike. Well, it certainly emphasizes the fact that the scripture is accurate when you can make an argument on the word as to whether it's singular or plural in form. Well, let's go up briefly to Shiloh, the place where Joshua set up the tabernacle during the occupation of Canaan. He said, I will cast lots before, for you before Jehovah in Shiloh, Joshua 18, verse 8, and this resulted in the tribal divisions. Now the word Shiloh is not only a place, but the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet till Shiloh come. Genesis 49.10, a clear reference to Jesus because of the symbols of authority. It's just history written in advance, and for our God, that isn't any problem. Now according to this Hebrew lexicon, Brown, Driver, and Briggs, the word Shiloh would refer to a person and only the Messiah could meet the requirements. But they suggest another possibility. He whose it is are that which belongs to him. So the verse may mean that the right of rule would never leave the tribe of Judah till the one came who had that preeminent right. And then he would assume it. The scepter would not depart. Now, since that is actually what happened, we may want to remember the statement in Hebrews. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priests. Hebrews 7, 14. In the Septuagint version, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, it reads, A ruler shall not fail from Judah, nor a prince from his loins, until there come the things stored up for him. That uses the other meaning of the word. And he is the expectation of the nations. And Shiloh is also possibly related to the word shalom, the word for peace in Hebrew. The scripture plainly declares he is our peace. Ephesians 2 verse 14. 
you along with others have wondered what the Urim and the Thummim were, are literally the lights and the perfections. Their use seems clear, but the way they gave the information is hard to say. These devices, maybe certain kinds of stones or devices with engraving on them, seem to enable a priest to ask a question and get a yes or no answer. 1 Samuel 28.30 indicated that thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. Now these were for determining the judgment for God's people and when Saul inquired of Jehovah, Jehovah answered him not, neither by dreams nor by Urim. The little stones wouldn't give any sign. I don't know if they light it up. I've never been able to find out anything about how that worked. But the priest could get his answer. 1 Samuel 28, 6. And that's when Saul was driven to seek the witch of Endor, a fatal venture. But when David came to Cala, he came down, a priest did, with an ephod in his hand, 1 Samuel 23, verse 6. Now, it may be that he had the Urim and the Thummim in this ephod, a kind of a vestment. And when Saul went forth to take David, David heard about the plan, and he said to Abiathar, Bring hither the ephod. And then said David, now here's how he used it, O Jehovah, the God of Israel, thy servant, has surely heard that Saul seeketh to come to Cala to destroy the city for my sake. Now listen. Will the men of Cala deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant has heard? O Jehovah, I beseech thee, the God of Israel, tell thy servant. And Jehovah said, he will come down. Now how that stone indicated it, or those stones, we're not told. But David understood, and he hid out, didn't he? So King Saul was frustrated again. These then, well, there's a last historical mention of them that has to do with the days of the Restoration when a number of men came back to Jerusalem and they claimed priestly descent. The Bible says they were deemed polluted and were put from the priesthood. And the governor said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. If genealogies were lost, then a priest could say, O oh Lord, are these men real priests? And the little stones would say yes or no. You know, Brother Wendell, you aren't just supposed to fellowship everybody that claims he's a priest of God. That's a pretty potent lesson in that if we had some time to preach on here. This business is accepting anybody and everybody who claims that he is a child of God will not stand the test of the Word of God. We have the inevitable information in the Scripture. Now, Bema, the high places, often refers to the worship on elevated places. Any holy place might become such an altar, and Canaan had many sanctuaries like that when Israel took over. God had said, however, An altar of earth shalt thou make unto me, and shall sacrifice thereon my burnt offerings and my peace offerings, thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thy oxen. In every place where I record my name, <coughs> I will come unto thee and bless thee. Exodus 20, verse 24. Practically speaking, wherever the Ark of the Covenant was, a priest was available, and this was considered an acceptable place of worship. But Deuteronomy 12, 5 points to Jerusalem, unto the place which Jehovah your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even to his habitation, God's house, shall ye seek, and thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings. Before Jerusalem was conquered, Samuel sacrificed at both Gilgal and Ramah, 1 Samuel 9 and 10 will tell you about that. So when Solomon arose, we read, only the people sacrificed in the high places because there was no house built for the name of Jehovah in those days, 1 Kings 3 and verse 2. So perhaps we should conclude that the high places were good or bad depending on the time in history and the things that were done there. The Nethanim, the temple servants, the first inhabitants that dwelt in their possessions in the cities were Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanim. First Chronicles 9, verse 2. 
Now, we've seen that some people have been excluded because they couldn't prove their right as priests. We wonder how these Nethanim were thought to be acceptable as servants. But in Ezra 2.58, they were included with the children of Solomon's servants. There were 392 of them when they returned in the days when Judah was restored. And in Ezra 5, they were included as those brought by Iddo, a man of discretion in answer to Ezra's plea for help. 220 Nethanim, all mentioned by name. Now, this word is from the root word, which means to give. So their name may simply mean the given ones. And they would have been classified as something on the order of the men of Gibeon who became servants in the days of Joshua. Hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation. Joshua 9 and verse 21. I recommend you read the rest of the book to find out what I would have said if my time had not been running low. Oh, it's very interesting. Now... <laughs> Now let's go to the throne scene of Isaiah as our time is getting away here. Seraphim is a plural word. Seraph means one, seraphim more than one. Only the plural form seraphim appears in scripture. When Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne, he tells us, above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the astonished prophet confessed not only his unworthiness, but that of all of his people. The first five verses of Isaiah chapter 6 give this marvelous throne scene. And it would be great this morning for us to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. The seraphim stand in the presence of God. They glorify God. They show great reverence as the expression of covering their faces indicate, as if the angels even are afraid to look directly upon the face of the Eternal One. They show great humility. They cover their feet but their swiftness is indicated by two more wings. When David once spoke of God, he said, He maketh the cloud his chariot, he walketh upon the wings of the wind, he maketh his angels winds and his messengers a flaming fire. And when David prayed, he said, God rode upon a cherub and did fly. Psalms 18, verse 10. And that marvelous text shows the extent to which God will go in answering the prayer of a righteous child of his that's in suffering. Now, the beings in Revelation chapter 4 seem to be a composite of the Old Testament cherubim and seraphim. There are four living creatures. In combinations, we find a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle in the likenesses, either in the faces or the form of the beings. And as in Isaiah 6, they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is to come. Our brief venture into the Old Testament words must end at this time. We've been to Shiloh, and we've waited for the coming of Shiloh. We have fought with aerials, and we have seen aerial marked for destruction. We've been to the high places and learned to worship God only as he requires us to worship. We've watched David as he was saved from destruction by warning from the Urim and the Thummim. We have thrilled to the seed promise, and we rejoice that in Christ we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. We have beheld God ride on a cherub, fly to the aid of his distressed child. And with Isaiah and John, we have watched the heavens open as the throne was revealed. We saw the mighty seraphim and heard their heavenly hymn to the glory of God. How great is the Lord, how blessed are his people, and how happy are all those who put their trust in him. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our 
our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. If you'll excuse me now, Annie and I have to leave for Grand Prairie. Brother Randall Hill, an elder at Burbank, called. He said, if you'll come over, we don't start till 1030. We'll do everything else first and sing till you get there. So I'll see you folk tomorrow, Lord willing. God bless you. Well, that was a mighty, mighty fine presentation by Brother Gibson. We're so grateful to him for his hours of research into some of these more difficult terms of the Old Testament. And surely that will inspire us every time we come across one of those words and do not understand what really is involved therein to do our own individual study and research on the same. I'd like to make these few brief statements before we dismiss for the intermission time. And that is that even now you can go ahead and purchase your tickets for the leadership dinner. They're 475, conducted on Tuesday at 5. Willard Collins will be speaking on Give Us Leaders Like the Prophets. And the sooner we do that, the better, of course, it will be for us all. You can browse for about 15 minutes. There are displays up and down the halls and in rooms. The books are now available out in the foyer, of course, as well as the tapes over to Brother Eccles' room over to my right down the hall. I believe these are the only announcements we need to make now, so we'll have about a 15-minute break, and then we'll begin the regular morning worship service. Thank you for being here for this session.